How are you? What was the best talk so far? Okay, all right, thanks. Um, I think what we might do, how, how are you feeling today? Okay, a bit Sunday morning? Sunday afternoon, thank you. Uh, anyone go out last night? Your students, right? So of course you went out last night. Okay, so I'm going to do this slightly annoying thing. We're all going to stand. Everyone stand? Slightly annoying, maybe a bit annoying. I'm giving you a talk about experiences, and so it's important that I don't just give a talk, but some of you vaguely remember. So, okay. And now, and, it, and you, there's no turning sideways, you have to stand straight, stretch out as much as you can. Doesn't matter if you bump into somebody, we're not insured, but I'm sure you'll be fine. No, no stretching up, you have to stretch out. If you bump into someone, that's fine. Okay, and now sit down again. Thanks. It's that, like, stri it's like stretch to kind of wake up and... Stuff. It's really exciting to be giving a, a talk at a TEDx event, especially at the LSE. And have any of you come across this book that I've written? A book called Stuffocation? Anybody? Okay, fine. Well, I've read it. I've written it as well as reading it. Uh, my mother has read it and some other people. When you hear the term stuffocation, is your first thought, this guy's a fraud, he's just made up some ridiculous word? Thank you. Or is, or is your reaction, you understand what it means? Anybody? Sense of what it means? Somebody play along with me. Say again. Second one. Okay, fine. So what do you, what do you think it means? Yeah. Too much stuff. Thank you very much for playing along with me. Okay, so it's about too much stuff. Um, I believe that one of the fundamental problems of our era is that we have too much stuff and that the, the value system, which has become the dominant value system today, which is materialism, is one of the defining problems of our era. It's been incredible for us, but it's causing us a bunch of problems. And so this word stuffocation, this made-up term, sums up all the problems with materialism. Now today's subject, uh, today's um, angle is the stories untold. So I'm going to tell this story, run through really kind of boring textbook -y kind of stuff, through, through a story. And um, it begins with the um, story of a guy very important, close to me, a guy called Jack. Jack was born in 1915, and this story begins on the 27th of January, 1940. So just take yourselves back to that time. So the Second World War is raging across Europe. But on this particular day, on this particular night, 27th of January, 1940, it was quiet in London. It was before the Battle of Britain. And in North London, near where Tottenham Hotspur play football, this man, Jack, comes out of a noisy, bustling, busy dance hall <coughs> with um, his new bride, Pam, holding hands. He turns to her, and you can see his breath in the air. He turns to her, he says, come on, let's go home. They have just got married. Now, uh, a few years later, Jack and Pam had a son, a guy called Alan, in 1944, and uh, they brought him up as best they could. They were really, they were, they were poor, they lived in a bed sit, so they had a bedroom and a sitting room. The, the kitchen facilities and the bathroom facilities were shared with other people who lived in the building. And um, they loved him, as you would do with a son, and every day Alan would wake to the smell of bacon and sausages and um, eggs and fried bread. Anyone here ever heard of fried bread? It's a thing that British people used to eat where they kind of put bread into fat and it's really not that good for you, but it's made sense because then Alan would go out and do his paper round. And um, so Alan had, because they had these two rooms, the, bed the bedroom and the sitting room, they would, once Alan got too big, they gave him the bedroom. So every night, Pam and Jack would make up a camp bed to sleep on in, in, the, the, city, in the sitting room and then put it back together again in the morning. And um, to this son, Alan, and then he went off to university in the 60s. He went to Liverpool in the early 60s and he saw the Beatles and the Rolling Stones before they were famous. If you ever meet him, you'll know because he'll tell you that in the first few minutes. He played football for the university team. He was the first person ever in the family to go to university. And afterwards, he did what? 
most people do. You know, he kind of finished his degree, he uh, carried on playing football, he got a sensible job, he got a job with IBM. In fact, in 69, he got married, he had two kids, and one of them is me. Alan's my father, Jack's my grandfather, Pam's my grandmother. And at this point, you might just be thinking, great, James, you're just telling us the story of your family. This is so <laughs> good, ha happy for you that you're telling us this story. But there, there is a point, because my, f my father, um, the journey, I think, from my grandparents to my father and then to me, in some way tells a story that I think resonates for lots of people, for lots of us. If you think about your parents and your grandparents and that change in the 20th century, from scarcity through to the abundance that we have today is quite striking. If you think about what life was like back in 1916, 100 years ago, of course the First World War was going on, but also think about what life was like. You know, the biggest problem for most people was finding enough food to put food on the table to feed the family. Is that a problem we have today? It's not, is it? Today, who worries about where they're going to eat tonight? How, what percentage of people worry about that in our society? We've gone from a time of incredible scarcity to a time of incredible abundance. And you can see this in terms of food is a great example. So the first time in human history, for the great mass of people, we had calorific abundance in the second half of the 20th century, thanks to the consumer revolution, industrial revolution, and the green revolutions. So for the first time ever, the big problem for most people wasn't finding enough food to feed the family, there was having so much, we had calorific abundance. What's that given us? Obesity. Thank you for whispering it, someone over there. <laughs> no, no, that was helpful, I forgot. That was useful. <laughs> Teamwork, I think. Um, we have obesity. Imagine telling somebody in 1916 that one of the big problems we have in society is there being so much food that it's not malnutrition that's our big problem, it's obesity. They would not have believed you. So obesity, for me, and suffocation are very much the same kind of idea. We've gone from scarcity to abundance. Scarcity of food to abundance of food, therefore we have this problem of obesity. And it's the same with suffocation. We've gone from scarcity of material things to this incredible abundance of material things that I can write a book with a, with a title that is suffocation and people don't just laugh at me, they get it. They get what it means. And I tell this story about my grandfather because I think you can see in the journey from my grandfather to my father to me and to my children, this journey as well. So the big problem for my grandparents was finding enough food to feed the family, and, you know, to survive, to carry on. And I think they represent all humans beforehand because if you look at what human existence has been ever since early modern humans appeared 120, 130 odd thousand years ago, the defining problem has been finding enough food to feed people. So then we have a situation with my father and he was, he doesn't like it when I say that he's materialistic. But people in the later part of the 20th century were materialistic and for a very good reason. Because I think what they were doing by embracing this idea of buying more pairs of shoes than they needed, more shirts than they needed, getting a new car every year. What they were doing is they were feeding this magical system of capitalism. And we are the lucky recipients of our, our ancestors taking on this idea in the 20th century. First constructed in the States in the 1920s and the other countries have adopted this system because what happened is they fundamentally changed our value system to become materialistic, to go from frugal, careful um, people into conspicuous, wasteful, profligate consumers. That's what happened in the 20th century. And what happened? So you had this value system of materialism underpinning consumerism as the activity and this overarching idea of capitalism. And what that did is it made our standards of living go from here to here. And we're the lucky recipients of that. And you could see it in, in, in my, my father. Um, we could, every year he would get a new car in the 70s and the 80s. I remember all these different cars that he used to, every like year or so, we would get excited. And me and my brother and my mum would literally be on tiptoes at the front window, 
excited for my dad to come home in this new car. And I remember, he, you know, he went from this really, what now looks like a horrible thing, this kind of like orangey coloured curvy car in the 70s. Uh, there was a Cavalier. He then had this kind of angular silver thing, a, a, um, a Vauxhall in the early 80s. And he ended the 80s in a red Porsche 911. He was doing quite well. He set up a business. And I remember him to this day, one of his best jokes was, um, God, I can picture him on his car phone. Anyone remember car phones? <laughs> yeah? Probably not. Um, and he would be on his car phone, and there's this joke that he liked to say, and it was that if you're, if you're not a communist at the age of 20, you haven't got a heart. And if you're not a capitalist by the age of 40, you haven't got a brain. <laughs> now, Mike, thank you for laughing, because he'll appreciate that, because my brother and I heard it so many times, we did not find that joke funny. But it was really interesting that... <laughs> That idea of, 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 of um, being capitalistic and being materialist and buying more stuff created this wonderful situation. And I think it's brought us to a, a time today where we have stuffocation, we have material crazy overabundance, we need to do something about it. Now, I've um, been working with companies and I've written lots of articles with lots of different people um, telling the future for the past 10 years. There's not time now for me to explain how that works, but... I've spent a number of years looking for solutions, and I don't believe some of the answers that people have been coming out with, the kind of smash the system, kind of you know, anti-capitalist, anti-consumerist kind of movements, solve the problems that we have in our society, while appreciating the magic of a capitalist consumer system. Because it's given us smartphones, for instance. It's given us a lot of the magic that we have, that we don't have to worry about having enough things to survive. And I think there was, there, was, there was a moment that inspired me to write this book, and it came from um, the day that my grandfather died. And it was the, um, it was the 27th of January, 2002. So it was 60, 62 years, is that right? 62 years um, after my grandparents got married, and my grandfather and my grandmother and my dad came over for lunch. I lived in Brixton at the time in South London. And if you just remember, they lived in a bed sit. My father was brought up in that. I had this, was my first flat, it was in Brixton. I had three bedrooms. I had a living room, a dining room, a great big garden. And I was working in advertising at the time. And I was probably, you know, a little cocky. Um, and, you know, talking, we had lunch. And it was really nice because it was their anniversary. And I was, you know, they were proud that I was doing well. And I was excited to share with them about where my life was going. And just before they left, my grandfather gave me a note. And um, on the note, he wrote, on this date in 1940, Nana and I trudged through snow to our first home. Good luck. Memories live longer than dreams. And just a little bit after they left, my, as my father was driving, um, a black BMW, in case you're keeping up with the cars. Um, they were just crossing the river and my grandfather did this weird choky thing and, <clears throat> and just collapsed in his seat. And my father stopped and then um, um, realised there wasn't much he could do and he, um, he had, drove as fast as he could. He actually got pulled over by the police and you know, kind of a classic scenario where he was pulled over and then the police gave him an escort and they hurried to the hospital, but my grandfather did die that day. And um, I've thought about that note because my grandfather wasn't a big writer. <laughs> He'd never given me a note before. I mean, he gave me birthday cards. He wrote, he just wrote, happy birthday, James. He, he wasn't that kind of man. <laughs> I mean, he really wasn't. I think my grandmother wrote the cards and he just put his name in at the bottom as, um, <laughs> yeah. But he, if he you know, it's it just, you know, that, that note has stayed with me and made me wonder about, you know, did he know he was going to die that day, first up? And if he did, or even if he didn't, what was he saying in that note? And my take on it is that what he was doing in that note was answering one of the most important questions a person can ask, the question that, that I think every one of us should ask, of ourselves, of our friends. It's the question that Aristotle asked in the Nicomachean Ethics almost two and a half thousand years ago. And that question is, how should we live in order to be happy? 
And my take on what he meant by memories live longer than dreams was that memories which come from experiences matter more than materialistic dreams. So there I was, this guy in advertising, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to achieve, this is what I'm going to have. And I think what he was saying was, remember the days we went to the museums together, the holidays we had, the time we hung out in the garden and ate the apples from the tree in their garden. Memories matter more than dreams. And that was the starting point, I think, for me to really start to think about this problem that we have with capitalism, with materialism, with this superabundance we have, in terms of how we should live our lives. And my take on it is that materialism was the answer in the 20th century, because for people like my father and all of our ancestors, people in the second half of the 20th century in particular, by being materialistic, by buying more things than they needed, sooner than they needed, they were feeding that really magical system of capitalism. They buy more stuff, it gives somebody a job, that person has more money to spend, it goes around the system, we have this incredible increase in standards of living. Lucky us. And I think the answer to that question, how should we live in order to be happy, has fundamentally changed. I, I think now what we should do is support this consumer capitalist system because if we want the good stuff that it brings, we need something to keep feeding the system. I don't want to smash the system. But I think what we need is to fundamentally alter the value system that underpins it to move from materialism to something I call experientialism. And by that I mean instead of looking for happiness, identity and status in material things, we should find happiness, identity and status in experiences instead. And I think this idea of experientialism has got the potential just as materialism was the standout great idea of the 20th century, I think this experientialism idea has got the, the potential to be the great idea of the 21st century. So materialism took us from scarcity to abundance. It took us from you know, wor worrying about enough food to feed the family to obesity, which is an easier problem to deal with, I think. And just as it revolutionised, transformed standards of living, I think experientialism and the experience revolution that comes with it has got the potential to radically transform quality of life. And what I mean by that is less stuff, less stress, less work, more enjoyable work, more enjoyable lives, better connections with friends and family, longer weekends, longer holidays. Just think about that idea of weekends for a minute. Who said that five days on and two days off is the pinnacle of human achievement? <laughs> Who thinks that four weeks holiday a year is like, wow, we've made it as a, as a species? And just bear in mind that the modern weekend was created by Henry Ford in 1926. These things can happen. So what I believe, once we move away from you know, the materialism where you kind of spend all that time earning money to buy stuff you don't need, to impress people you don't like. Instead, shifting that perspective, you know, changing that perspective and thinking about experiences instead. And that move from standards of living to quality of life, from GDP as our key indicator of success to something about well-being, which includes within it GDP. So to sum up, um, you know how Jamie, you know Jamie Oliver? You know Jamie Oliver has the food revolution. What he wants people to do is to be healthy. He wants to help people be healthier by getting them to spend ever le to, to eat less unhealthy food and eat more healthy food. What I'm hoping to do is to spark an experience revolution. And for everyone to, I want people to be happier and to help them do that by spending ever less of their time, focus and energy on stuff and spending ever more of your time, focus and energy and money on experiences instead. Thank you.